Welcome, everybody, to another Dynamic Real Talk episode. Uh, today, I bring you my guest. Today is coming from Chi Shenzhen, China, Mr. Mark Reinhardt, the Managing Director of Whitehorse Laboratories, the man who is mitigating all the, the uh, supply chain right now with all the uh, products in the marketplace. We all know the shortages are happening. He is in the trenches right now in Asia, especially in China, dealing with all the mitigation, helping counterfeit avoidance and all the testing failure analysis are helping contract manufacturers, OEMs. But um, but I'll let Mark introduce himself and what really what what what's Whitehorse and what's Whitehorse all about. Good afternoon, Rob. And uh, thanks for having me on board. I really appreciate it. Um, the as you mentioned, it's been pretty dynamic here for the last year and a half, let alone the past year when the shortages hit forefront. Um, so that's kind of really what we do is come into more of a, the forefront, I think, um, over the past year and a half. Um, like I started White Horse back in 2004. I came from a component manufacturing in, a, in an EMS background. Um, I was already here in China with the component manufacturer, and we were like it was kind of new to us when we first got over here to that we had to protect our own production scrap from getting circulated back into the marketplace. Um, so we came aware, much more aware of the counterfeit issue at that point um, and working with subcons and trying to control them that this was just a, a supply chain security thing we hadn't really thought about when we were in the U.S. Um, and so you know, I started White Horse in 2004, staying here in Shenzhen specifically to combat that problem. Since then, we've grown on to to do other um, think failure analysis and life cycle and reliability testing, move beyond components to PCB and PCBA and factory auditing. But um, all that aside, I mean, the, the, the headline news is obviously the, the shortages and um, like what's being pushed into the supply chain. I've been referring to it all year, like the, the, the chums in the water and the sharks are circling. Um, when there's, when there's a market situation like this, the, the, the opportunities for substandard, either you know, defective or refurbished or counterfeit product to get pushed into the marketplace is pretty extreme. And that's what all of us have been combating in the, um, really this year, I would say probably since March, it really went mainstream, um, although it was picked up significantly since last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thank you for that. You know, myself and Mark, you know, I've, we actually go back many years. Uh, I've been tra traveling today really? in person. He's not only I've done factory tours, he's also helped train some of our staff, do tours, process, EVI, understand how the process works for flow, for this, some of the mitigation place of the quality standards that we put into play into our operation. He's also helped assist through the process. And over the last, I don't know, probably five to 10 years, we've really worked together closely yeah. to go through this process. And as everybody celebrates each other, but it's been fortunate we haven't seen each other for about two years now since the last time yeah. I was in China, you know, now yeah. it's in this virtual world, but that's a big thing that we're growing. It's everything's been virtual. And it's it's like, how do you grow and scale business in a virtual world? But of course, you're on the ground. You're um, especially in China. Everybody knows, of course, I mean, the world knows a lot of the components, raw materials, semiconductors, fabric, everything is 70% of the materials are made in China. So, and that's a place where a lot of transaction, because it's the highest usage of components is in Asia in general. China with yeah. Southeast Asia, count, um, bringing that back in that up a little bit. So what have you seen? I mean, in the last, um, I would say, you know, at least 15 years have in Whitehorse, what have you seen change in the supply chain until the present day? Because there's unprecedented stuff that's changing, but from the starting Whitehorse, what have you seen change in the supply chain? Um, really, I would, I mean, the overall, I'll look at it in two ways. I'll look at the overall supply chain for one, and then I'll look at you know, like the, the, the counterfeit um, issue or the evolution. Um, that's probably the best way to discuss it. I'll probably touch on that first and then go into an overall supply chain um, appearance from our side anyway, is that the, the counterfeiters, the guys that are, that are selling um, this, are pushing this product in, they've just gotten much, much better at it. When I started White Horse, we were the only game in town and they were like, no one was looking. Um, I mean, and the suppliers knew that nobody was looking, so they didn't even try to mask it. You could wipe the marking off with your thumb. It was easy. Um, and since then, they've just gotten much more advanced and, I mean, frighteningly so um, advanced in how they're able to mask some of this defective product and what product they're able to use as clones to be able to push in. Um, that has certainly changed, and it's evolved to the point that we've got an R&D team that has to try to stay a, a step ahead of them. Like, what could we think that they're going to be doing next that might be able to get around in um, the current inspection methods? So um, what can we do to kind of proactively look at what they might be doing? I mean, like when they started taking the metal lids off the, um, the FPGAs, uh, that was, I mean, that was like, hang on a second. <laughs> Bloody hell, they're actually doing that. Okay, all right. Um, and he's like, no, 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 that's not happening. He's like, 
we can see the metal lids. I mean, they're in the markets. <laughs> Um, so that's certainly evolved. Um, the, the technology they have at their disposal and the margins they make on this stuff makes it quite difficult, um, you know, more difficult than before to detect, particularly the higher end devices, because um, they just, they're pretty robust and the, the, the budget they have to work with to, to mask things has gotten more complex. So that'd be certainly one thing. The industry though has is, is evolved with it, um, which has been very healthy to watch from our perspective. Um, 17 years ago, there weren't standards. There was manufacturing standards, but there were no counterfeit detection standards. Um, those exist today, which is very healthy. The, the um, awareness throughout the industry is much higher. So um, we're not push, we're not fighting that battle anymore of the need to do it. It's how far do we need to go. Um, and the standards are an excellent guideline in terms of what we need to be looking for and particularly how to communicate with customers that really don't necessarily know um, what are the right methods to use and using a standard we can communicate and guide them um, in terms of what's, what is necessary. Um, there's some concern sometimes about going overboard um, and we don't want to do that, but we certainly don't want to um, leave risk available. So that's part of what we do, um, at least at the front level, is to do a risk assessment. This is the type of the device. This is the application it's going to. This is where we see risk. Um, and this is what is necessary to test in order to validate if this potential problem actually exists or not. Um, supply chain wise, it's um, a, a, the components themselves, you know, the, the Basic devices are made um, in China. That's kind of when I came over here, that's what we were doing. I mean, what we made weren't really complex. Um, the, the design into them was was quite involved in the material, the right materials to use, for example, to eliminate the noise um, and crosstalk between devices. Yeah. Um, that design side was there, but the manufacturing process was very manually intensive. So that was done here. But China's moved upstream yeah. from very basic components that are manually produced to um, higher end devices that China has their own way for fabs now. Um, as you mentioned, just so much of the end use, uh, actually now much more of the end use, but the actual production is done here, that this is where the excess and surplus inventories are. Even though China doesn't account for a huge amount of semiconductor manufacturing, um, it's still the highest user of semiconductors uh, in terms of manufacturing. Obviously, the domestic market has picked up a lot, so that's a big, huge user as well. So this is where that inventory lies. Um, so like I know in 2012, there was some counterfeit um, electronics detected in U.S. military hardware, and there, there was a can't buy from China movement. And that lasted about six months until everyone went, well, that's where the stuff is. You can't <laughs> shut that out. You just have to be more careful. Um, so we kind of flowed back to some more rationalization there. Um, as the higher end material is moved here, obviously the cost um, cost structure in China has increased quite dramatically, particularly in real estate. Um, and so the manufacturing has been migrating within China. And then recently, and this, this was in place well before COVID and everything else, and like the, the trade war started, this was, was in place for the last 10 years. Um, but there's been a migration of manufacturing within China and then outside of China to lower cost areas and also some regionalization. Um, I think that's what we've been talking about the last year and a half. There's a lot of the, you know, minus the politics of yeah. good guys and bad guys and all that stuff. Um, there's, and it's not, not the world we live in. Um, we live in like, what what actually happens on a daily basis. Um, but it's really just been a cost perspective as well as a realization of risk management for regionalization. Um, yeah, Taiwan went through, sorry, not Taiwan, but um, like, Thailand went through flooding several years ago, and then all of a sudden the hard drives, um, there was a crisis in hard drives, um, the tsunami hit Japan, and all of a sudden there's like RF inductors were, were in shortage. Um, uh, with COVID, I mean, there's been, like there was a, in, when China was in lockdown, it's like, okay, let's move everything to Southeast Asia. Um, and then Southeast Asia went through lockdown, it's like, right, let's everybody move it back to China. Uh, so, um, <laughs> The natural disasters, that, COVID pandemic has, has all. Yeah. yeah. And, and they've been chasing the, yeah. it's, that's probably been the, I don't know, the, the weirdest thing to, to, to observe is how these natural disasters are following the supply chain. Um, every time, right, well, let's go here and something happens there and it kind of redirects traffic in terms of what people are trying to do to mitigate the risk they're running away from and they end up running right back into it just out of pure bad luck. Um, so I, I think that migration is going to continue. Um, there's a lot of talk of, of regionalization for risk management. Um, 
and that just makes sense. Uh, I mean, there's there's always a cost structure to things, but um, the risk factor is higher. Or, you know, could be anything from a natural disaster to politics to you know, any of that sort of thing can affect, and it shuts down the supply chain. And we're seeing now what the the real impacts of a major shortage are. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the pandemic. And thanks for explaining that um, um, and going over the. The, the the I guess the last fifteen years of the production cycle, supply chain, where we are, and the there was there was a lot of natural disasters, just like you said, Japan, Thailand. Um, and we had also a tariff issue that happened recently in the last four years, and that was a thing of reallocation because of tariffs coming to the states. People want to move. Okay, we'll move it to Mexico, with Southeast Asia, we'll move those twenty point five percent tariffs. These all came into play, um, but then we hit. The, the pandemic and nobody knew it was unknown. This is, is an unprecedented change. Um, we are in a disruption of it. And it, it comes to a lot of the supply chain, just like you said, a lot of the components I just come back to are in China. From my experience, yeah. they are, and they're from, they're used by big EMSs. The big EMSs yep. are consuming a lot of them, exporting them to Europe, to US, to all over the world, yep. massive consumption. And yep. the price points, for those mass consumption are much lower than the general retail price, as you would say. In the you know these are contracted prices, and those yep. excess inventories after product flow into the market because these companies they do sell they 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 exit they, they sell their excess because it's just the projects ended they have extra inventory they sell it out at a lower price, and it does that that market has always been their electronics we've all known that it just today it's even more predominant when when supply chain breaks and lead times are 60 weeks and yeah. everybody's wanting to find those components all right so it's uh, it's it's it's, great. it's it's amazing so that's why i want to get to the point of when that comes into play right now as you said quality certifications everybody's getting very more technical and quality as yep. guidelines absolutely 6081 guidelines you've been following i know we've been close in contact you following those guidelines you're improving your test methodologies the processes form fit functional comparisons and all the test reporting. But then when it comes to um, that that testing and what is right now predominantly uh, the types of components you're working on and what are the test protocols you are doing or implemented with your current customers that are coming to you? The It's gone through some waves actually this year. Um, the CPUs were like, very dominant um, in like in May, uh, May and June. We've seen that hasn't so much declined as now um, the, the linear devices, um, specifically the regulators. Regulators now are um, in dramatic shortage and we're seeing a lot of those. Um, I mean, generally, we always recommend starting with a visual inspection. It sounds kind of basic, but it is the absolute first step. That's also where we analyze the device type and where are we seeing um, like variations or potential issues on a device. So that's included with the visual inspection process is to do an analysis. It's basically like a risk assessment. Um, from there, you know, we can do a decapsulation to see if the, the original die markings are there. We're seeing um, quite a bit of concern over um, not just a counterfeit device, somebody that's marking a, you know, a, a an alternate manufacturer as the requested manufacturer. We're seeing a lot more concerns about actually somebody getting their hands on the original die. Um, they might be downgrades or production scrap. So it's actually the original die. So decap loses some value at that point. Um, uh, we can't say it loses some value, but it's not the end all solution because we still have some other questions. A like production scrap from, the, from a um, component manufacturer, if somehow that gets circulated into the marketplace, decap is just going to show that it's an original device. Um, it's not going to tell us that it doesn't function correctly. Um, so, we're, so there are some concerns about either um, either second second grade tier two devices being um, wafers being sold into the market or getting in, infiltrating the market or people getting their hands basically on the plates on how to um, do the die masks and to replicate those dice. Um, and that's that's even scarier when we see somebody um, that's cloning actually the wafer itself. Um, not the function, uh, trying to get close to the functionality, but when they're actually, you know, it's the same thing as counterfeit currency. When you got the plates to actually print the money, Wow, um, that becomes very, very problematic, and DCAP is not going to tell us that. It's um, higher level electrical testing is required to do that. 
Um, so the parametric testing, there's a functional test and then you can go up to parametric at temperature range. Um, we've tried to redefine the test levels because this isn't, doesn't really exist and we understand that most buyers are not um, electronic engineers. So we've tried to simplify things into a risk, uh, sorry, in, into a test level. So like a level one is something very basic. Um, the level six is a parametric test at temperature range. Um, and we can cover everything in between. And that's really what we need to target. Um, if we're looking at this type of device, what's the difference between product A and product B in terms of its electrical performance? And that's what we need to target in electrical testing. All right, all right, we've then verified that the output voltage is correct and it operates at the right temperature range. This is the correct device. Um, and those things can only be verified through electrical testing. Yeah, I mean, that's through that grade of, okay, so the test protocols, you do basic EVI inspection, and then you can go into um, checking. EVI involves all the surface levels, measurement of size, you know, measurement of components, leads, you know, uh, then going to decap and x-ray, and then from that point and get into functional elect electrical testing. And it gets to the point where also, do you also test the composite, like XRF testing, composite the materials going into it? Cutting, yes. you know, what type of uh, other processes do you go through? The um, like X-ray is uh, through decap. X-ray is good because it uh, does give us some variance. If there are mixed prod, if there are mixed batches, we can see the variations. We've seen a lot, and this has happened more recently, of what we call dummy parts. Mm -hmm. um, there is no dye inside; it's just plastic and pins. Um, you can actually buy these things online. They're used for marketing purposes as well as um, uh, they're used for automation. Um, they set up auto, you know, set up production lines using these basically these just dummy parts. I mean, you're not gonna waste a lot of value on product to set up your production line. So these things are available that can just be marked as the device you want as long as the package type is the same. Um, but visual inspection really is the first step. Um, X-ray will give us some variations that we need to see as well as some product. Some of the production failures become evident under X-ray. Um, okay. Broken bond wires or delamination and some other defects we can see through X-ray that will help detect those factory rejects. Um, XRF is generally has been used as a tool for like the lead finish. Is it a lead-free part or not a lead-free part? Yeah. Um, we try to take a step further than that to say, right, what? I mean, we can cover almost every metallic element with this thing. What else are we looking for? Um, so it's not just the lead finish we are looking at. Um, like we can tell you if it's a class one or a class two ceramic capacitor um, by targeting the materials inside. I remember um, like a few years ago, MLCCs were a big thing. And that yep. was so that that tool came in very handy to test material yep. composition of MLCCs. Yep. Absolutely. We can tell you if it's a class one or a class two without having to temp do temperature range electrical testing, um, which was critical because that's expensive and it takes a long time. Um, so we could weed out some of those class twos right off the bat if they're a class one device. Um, MLCs are a good one to use as an example, actually, because there's so many variations um, and the, the typical methods aren't going to find it. Um, so you look at like an automotive grade, since automotive is struggling with about everything right now. Um, an automotive grade MLCC has a soft termination. Um, there's a there's some flex built into it. So under uh, high mechanical stress, like when you slam the brakes on your car, you don't want your MLCCs to be popping off the board because the board's going to flex a little bit um, mm -hmm. from that mechanical stress of deceleration. Um, and, and, um, yeah. When it flex, those chips are going to they're going to crack and they pop all over the place potentially. Um, so they've put in flex termination, so the the MLCC can flex a little bit with the board and they won't crack. Um, that you're not gonna find that under visual inspection, you're not gonna find that under electrical testing. You have to cut it open, um, cross section and look for the extra layer of soft termination material on the inside. Um, you know, we can tell if it's a class one or a class two with XRF, but um, can't tell you if it's a X7 or X5 um, right. uh, material without testing at temperature range. Yeah. Um, we can do visual inspection, 0805 cap looks like an 0805 cap. Um, it, you can't tell visually what capacitance value it has or what the tolerance level is. Um, so all that, and that's, it, it's the resources available at, at our, you know, like in our arsenal of uh, the equipment and tools that we have to detect, but it's breaking down the part number. All right, what is this supposed to be? And what do we need to hit to, um, to make sure that those issues are all covered? So when, let me, for, as a case study, uh, when a potential client or someone comes to you with a component, it could be, a, you know, IC or say a capacitor, any point, you guys have a library. Sure. Right? I know you have your new, your Pegasus system, you have a lot of data, yep. use all of this. So that comes in and you can 
immediately identify the part number if you have it in your library and have comparison or like a, a apples and or you can compare apples to apples. You can see, okay, we've have a current test from an old test report or how, how does that work? Yep. Um, first thing, yeah, that is one of the first things we do to look to see if okay. what we've got on file. Um, okay. we are, we're very careful to differentiate between uh, golden samples, reference samples and unknown samples. Just because okay. we've got it on file doesn't mean that it was a good one. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to look at what the source was. We have to take a look at what the results were, um, any feedback post-testing um, to make sure that we're using the right sample. But all that stuff's at our disposal. Um, that's, that's part of what we've discussed with the new client. We've seen this before, so we've got some reference information to work with. We do track in our system which ones are you know, verified golden samples. We need the traceability actually to call it a golden sample. If somebody just sends us a part and says that's a golden sample, um, we don't always refer to it as such um, because we're not we're not familiar with the source um, and it, we, we've <laughs> we've seen guys that send us like the exact same fake parts that they sent us for testing and called one a golden sample. It's like uh, that's a little too obvious. Yeah. Um, so we, we'd certainly see that, but um, like having reference samples is certainly an advantage, um, or and having that database on file. Um, we do we do search the other databases to see if anything has been reported that we might need to target. Um, but uh, what we ultimately where we're getting at is trying to get the customer into the right test plan. Um, our job is to provide risk mitigation. Um, so we give them the options and explain where there's risk um, and you know, can work with them to make sure they get into a right test plan. Too. And there always is a cost to quality um, ratio. Uh, when we go back to the uh, cost of quality, because the last few years, you know, there's been a lot of changes in the processes and having the traceable uh, golden sample um, to be able to test with the whatever, uh, as I said, the suspected or the, the the component purchased from an open market with untraceable sources yep. to make sure we can test the process. And then, and of course, you've always told us this is the best way to do is to get a traceable sample. Of course, we need the obsolescence. Yep. There is nothing out there. Yep, but there is a cost of quality. As you said, sometimes the cost goes up because I know sometimes testing, basic testing could be two, three hundred dollars and go up to thousands of dollars depending on test fixtures, yep. right? So how yep. detailed, that's a question for you, is how detailed do you get into some of these MCUs, these processors, FPGAs, to be able to really test, the, how much in depth can you get into testing for the um, authenticity of the component? Um, the more complex the device, I, um, when we look at the, you know, we've got a chart of all the different device types and a general rule of thumb is the simpler the part, the more prolific the counter available clones are going to be. Um, the more complex device, the fewer people that can make it. So the lower you, chance you have of an alternate manufacturer pushing something into this, um, pushing in that's a clone to it. Um, so what we target there are we target the electrical, uh, the, the, the differences between versions within the same product family. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look like at an FPGA, very high value devices, um, and they are they come in like a commercial or an uh, industrial and aerospace temperature grades, and they have you know, up to three to four different, some of them even five, um, different speed grades, or they might have different memory capacity. Um, so in the metal top BGAs, uh, FPGAs are particularly difficult and same with processors. Um, if they do a very clean job of removing and replacing that, it's very difficult to detect with electric, oh, sorry, with visual inspection. So we really need to vary, okay, is this an industrial grade device or not? So we need to test it at speed grade and at temperature range. Um, and that's the level of testing that we can get to. Um, it becomes very expensive on higher pin counts um, and complex devices because the engineering time to write the test program into the ATE system, that takes quite a while. Um, a socket for a thousand pin device is expensive. Um, and like, because well, yeah, but you're going to use it again. Not really. That's why we have to buy it this time because we haven't had to get one before. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the cost certainly goes up, but generally it's fairly roughly equivalent, not equivalent, but the the ratio is there for um, like the cost of testing to the cost of the device. Um, yeah. Very expensive devices are probably not going to be cheap to test. Yeah. Um, the the individual methods for like MLCCs are kind of unique in that there's so many varieties and it's not a simple solution. Testing capacitance is like 10% um, uh, of answering the question um, on an MLCC. So we do need to go more. So that's kind of a that's the against the rule of thumb that testing like an MLC is actually a little more expensive um, per value of the part, but you buy millions of them at a time. So if you look at that over the, uh, of the total cost of the product, um, it's still fairly low. 
Um, but yeah, because everybody, you know, there's there's certain- certain- I know of these parts, and if those parts, especially MLCC, in the last couple of years, when we went, you were had a lot of temperature testing, high, low temperature yeah. chambers. It takes time. Yeah. This is a time yep. domain. Some people don't realize that the intensity and the scale of being able to, ch- I mean, these micro MLCCs are micro, I mean, they're tiny under, you know, right. tweezers to put them in there and you need to push them and cool them. It's over certain, you know, 100, I don't know, 80, minus 80 to 150 back and, and let them cool and test tolerance to see the, the types yep. of uh, tolerance range, the gaps that go into. So these, there's a lot more involved. That's why we said that the cost can go higher because there's more yeah. time needed. Right. Yeah. The the testing at temperature range takes about 20 minutes per device, um, because not only do you have to lower it down to the minimum operating temperature that's defined by the manufacturer, you have to keep it there. Um, uh, You have to let it sit at that temperature. So the inside is the same temperature as the outside. Otherwise, it's just surface testing. Um, So, yeah, it takes about 20 minutes per piece. And then you do the math on it. That takes a while. Um, and we have to we're, you're measure the device while it's being tested as well. It's not like you just run it through this temperature profile and test it at the end. You have to test it at each step because um, all these all these specifications are defined by the manufacturer. Um, and but what so, that's a good question that brings up is sample size. You know how how do you guys yeah. identify sample size from the testing from the volume coming from lot code that you test each lot or what what is the sample size per you know per quantity that you would test or the, per, per test. AS6081 has really helped with this um, okay. in terms of, of defining it within the industry um, and, and pushing it downstream outside of manufacturing. Um, buyers aren't really familiar with their own IP or uh, incoming quality control does. Okay. At a manufacturer level, incoming quality control generally looks at an AQL. Yeah. So given this lot size, this is how many pieces we're going to have. And those charts are variable depending on like the risk of source and the risk of application. Mm-hmm. Um, and the risk of the device itself. So those factor, those charts can change a little bit, but usually we refer to the AQL because um, that's the standard that's used by manufacturing. So at, if the conversation goes downstream far enough it just, as it should, um, it gets to the end users engineering team and they're like, yeah, that would be the same um, sampling plan that we would use for incoming quality control. Um, AS61 defines um, uh, 122 pieces for visual inspection, three pieces for um, like DCAP XRF, uh, 45 pieces for X-ray. Um, but the standard already defines those sampling plans. So um, the, the, the number of samples affects the cost. So like, there's a perception, at least before there was a perception that we're quoting a high sampling plan in order to charge more. And it's like, no, it's safer. I mean, you can go to a lower sampling plan, but it's a higher risk. Um, so the 6081 really helped clarify that from our perspective that the sampling plan, and it should be done by date or lot code. So if you receive five lot codes, sorry, you got to do this on each single, every single one of them. Um, that's really helped us explain these sampling plans to customers who are, uh, buyers have tended to look at it as a like way for us to charge <laughs> charge more. No, that's not exactly the plan. Um, it's risk mitigation and lower samples. You just have a you know, like a smaller percentage, uh, lower chance of finding the problem. Yeah, I mean that comes down to, I mean who who's buying the component, the cost, the quality, how much you want to spend to yeah. mitigate the risk, um, and go into that process because of course. I know probably some of your clients are everybody just, you know, right now it's a shortage market. It's a buy, sell, anything on inventory yep. people are buying. It's very hard. So, um, but it comes to a point of also educating the customer. And that's one yep. thing that I think today we still, as a supplier, your due diligence is to also educate your customer or your OEM. Because a lot of the OEMs are still, some of them, I mean, a lot of them are, but still I would say 50% of them don't have any type of, they don't, they just follow a regiment that's been in there for a long time. And because they have such a big corporation and they don't have, yep. they don't sometimes even notice on AS guidelines because they don't follow AS guidelines. They don't follow AS 9120, yep. 6081. They don't know when you, when you throw this terminology out there, they don't really understand that the, yeah. what protocol falls under it. And even though you want to explain to them, so it's also the, the, the distributor or the supplier's due diligence or responsibility to educate them and show them the process of what they're doing using your services yeah. or any company services to be able to do these testing protocols. So how often are you now, and especially in this era, in this last, last year, educating now, working with a lot of big OEMs and manufacturers of educating their SQEs or all the departments? Well, I, I've always estimated that our, you know, like our sales team probably spends about 20 to 30% of their time in education. 
Um, and whether it's explaining the report or explaining a test plan and why this testing, uh, this test method or that test method would be recommended and what we're trying to find from it. Um, uh, explaining the different device types, uh, like right, this is a processor, this is what it's supposed to do. The, uh, doing an open short test on this is not going to give us an answer. I know, I know that's the answer you want because it's fast and cheap, but it's not <laughs> very complete. Um, so yeah, I would I would estimate twenty to thirty percent of our time. Um, like in two thousand nineteen, two, actually two thousand eighteen, we started it and we carried through. In two thousand nineteen, we were doing quarterly seminars. Um, to and, and your team came to those and it was fantastic because we're we're you know, like this is how this this is the type of device. This is how it's made. This is the construction of it. This is what we need to find. And, um, and we just spent those those were half day sessions. They're about four hours a piece. Um, Obviously, with the pandemic, we've had to suspend that. We've been trying to, if we haven't had the time with the, with dealing with the shortages, we have not had time to be able to convert that format over to webinars, um, which we, in, we intend to do because it's just, uh, I see that as one of the services that we provide. It's part of the value that we provide. It's not just the testing, it's the the explanation, it's the the service work of goes in of telling people, all right, this is what we're, this is what we need to do. Um, and this is why, rather than just quoting a test and and, and hoping the uh, customer understands what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, because you guys collect a tremendous amount of data on components through testing. Yep. And that is priceless in this marketplace, especially dealing with mitigation, counterfeit mitigation, supply chain. People are trying to look under any stone purchase, procure from anywhere because they have a line down, they can't ship, they can't get revenue. These are a lot of challenges. Um, the, a lot of companies are because if you cannot ship that end product, that widget that you're producing out the door, you can't invoice, you can't get revenue coming in. So people are panicking. Yep. And they are going to, as we know, the creativity of a lot of these, uh, these so a lot of these companies out there creating these amazing websites, legitimate and creating uh -huh. things that, yeah. and they just said, you know, they look like an official and they transfer money and never talk to them again and never hear from them again. And I know a lot of this has happened. So have you had an experience or other clients have you been hearing about this more and more recently? Yeah, we've, we've seen this a lot. And I, I mean, we've seen it a lot in the last couple of years, and this is obviously what those guys are targeting. Um, mm -hmm. They're targeting desperate buyer buyers who are you know, like they're going through distribution, whether they're independent or authorized distribution channels like they should. Um, they aren't getting the answer that they need um, or the one that uh, they're getting the answer that they need, which is the truth. They aren't getting the answer that they want, which is, yeah, I have parts available. Um, so they're desperate and they're going into, they do, you know, they drop into a Google search under a part number, but like these guys are scraping those databases and pulling up those part numbers. Um, and like, yeah, send us the money because desperate buyers are diving into this marketplace um, and they haven't been, they haven't been prepared for it. Um, and like they haven't necessarily even worked with independent distributors before who do warn them about these risks. That's, this is the, this is what you guys do. Yeah, um, you explain to your, you explain to the end user what the risks are and why they need to work with, like, with companies where they have quality control protocols in place. Um, and, but this is this is how it was 17 years ago. People would just go online and buy stuff and then receive it and ship it. And that's you know, that's, that's when we started 17 years ago. That was the market standard. And I'd just buy them from somebody and reship them because we the margins were fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean that recycle. Um, but at, at least they receive product most of the time. But yeah, now we were seeing so much of it that um, you know, like this is wire fraud. I mean, they're they're luring people in with fake inventory, and it's they're really targeting the obsolete stuff. Uh, but they've moved up to target everything that's in shortage, and the higher value, the better. Um, and they say, yeah, we've got them, and wire us the money, and and then they're gone. Well, as technology moves, electronics, they they can, they get smart. They have bots. They can scrape what's been searched. They know yep. what's happening. They can put the part numbers out there. They know the pricing is shifting, is changing. Um, it, it's amazing. But it kind of comes back to reputable suppliers that have quality QMS systems in place through AS guidelines or through process that they put in there that they have these and working with accredited people because every yep. day at my our my our sales team globally, uh, new customers are coming in because everybody's hunting. They're asking. They're trying to. I mean, it's a good thing for a lot of business, but you still can't can't skip the service because you can't find the components. But then yep. you have to go through the process. Oh, we, we don't need to test it. We'll test it them ourselves. I'm like, no, everything that comes out of our warehouse has to be tested. It doesn't matter. If we have sure. no traceability, it has to go through this process. Like, no, don't yep. worry. We'll handle it. And I'm like, no, that's not going to handle. Oh, we can test it ourselves. Yep. 
I'm like, no, it, these are, this is where it all comes that gray area. Yeah. They're not at the end of the day, a lot of them aren't educated. They, they're just trying They have a fire and they want to put it out as fast as they can because if testing takes one to two weeks, they want yeah. to do it right away. Just yeah, they, starts. Yeah, and they need to be in production right away. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. And I know, we, we know that lead times are, I mean, not just the component lead time, but our own lead times are extended beyond where, where we're comfortable with just the, the demand for, for, Product from this market is, and at least people are looking at you know, doing testing. But um, we're not we're we're not turning in days anymore. We're turning in you know, like in a week or two, and that's and we're we're, we're continue to work on that because we know the demand is there. But we see people are stopping midstream and say, oh, "We'll just ship it." I'm like, wow, okay. Um, I mean, that's that's very risky. Um, now this is kind of stuff that we went through ten years ago that um, trying to educate buyers. You, you can't do that. I mean, so you can, that, but it's not a good the- idea. It's a good question to ask is how's the capacity issues? I mean, how we in the last say six months, I know you've expanded capacity, but how yeah. how is this right in the last say two quarters? You know, we're going from summertime, not coming out of the summer, going into the I would say fall winter. Do you see yep. each month? How is August or how is July and August and how do you see September coming? What how is the the the, the trend happening on your end? Um it's just continued to I think the volume has actually just continued to increase in terms of the activity. Um We've gotten and you know, like as the um, as the regulators really like those came in like all of a sudden um, and that one like we put capacity everywhere else and then we didn't have capacity there um, so we do like we doubled the amount of test equipment we have in that area we've got an engineering team uh, on testing those as well but just the volume kind of hit and we're behind schedule now. we're behind where we'd like to be in terms of lead time on that. Mm-hmm. Um, Generally, like historically, there's usually kind of a cyclical downturn um, around the holiday period because people are taking holidays off. We were kind of expecting it with the summer holidays in North America and Europe. Um, it happened a little bit. Um, it felt a little quieter, but the numbers didn't did, <laughs> didn't say that didn't give us the same answer. Um, I would suspect it's going to slow down a little bit in November and December. Um, and then like, we've got Chinese New Year right at the beginning of February. So that's always a cyclical slowdown with the holiday breaks. And I think when people have been as busy as they are, those holidays become a little bit more important um, that people really need that time off to get some rest. Um, but yeah, I would I would suspect that it's going to slow down a little bit in terms of just in terms of market demand. But um, sorry, that's. I'm going to backtrack on that. I don't think that's correct. Um, yeah, we we are reading the reports of of automotive manufacturers furloughing employees to delay production because they can't get chips. I think as fall well, as long as they can get chips, they'll be in production because their own backlog is so heavy. Um, there might be some smaller downturn just from holiday schedules that you know, people aren't working on Christmas Day, for example. But um, yeah, I don't think we're going to see as dramatic a cyclical slowdown over the holidays probably is in years past because the backlog is so heavy. Yeah, so from being in the ground in China where the, one of the major consumers electronics manufacturing, what have you heard from a lot of your clients that are local there or manufacturers you work with with their um, with, with their backlog? And how long do they think that we will be in this with the chip shortage? Is it getting worse? Is it going to get better? What have you heard? Um, at the beginning of well, so probably around June, we heard that Q3 was probably going to be as deep as the shortage situation was going to get. Um, and then Q3 rolled around and you've got guys like Intel saying that this is going to last until 2023. Um, I, I don't see it lasting in that intensity until 2023, but there are going to be device types that go into shortage because manufacturers are having to allocate. Um, they're allocating production to automotive grade parts there right now because that's where the I think there's some government um, influence in getting automotive manufacturers up. So they're, they're they're shifting their own capacity to to that grade of device, but they're starving commercial and industrial. Um, so when automotive is out of the shortage situation, everybody else will have been been it been in it for quite a while. Um, so yeah, I see that I see it kind of lasting for quite a while. I think when it ends, it's going to end somewhat abruptly. Um, and that the, diff- the the gap between the component manufacturers through their distribution channels, which are kind of convoluted, um, from the man- component manufacturer to the end user, there's a lot of people involved in that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think the component manufacturers actually know how much product is in that and the, is in that segment of the pipeline. So by the time they get the word from the manufacturers that they are satisfied. Um, there'll be so much inventory that's already in the pipeline um, that it's going to 
you know, cause them to probably scale back some production. But yeah, I mean, you, I you, that, that's gets to double ordering, triple ordering, and that's the the distribution yeah. has it direct to the manufacturer. The tier ones, of course, are always for priority for their allocation. Um, but I mean, yeah. from some of the calls I've actually been on with some of the executives and semiconductor insights Asia, a lot of the wafers aren't the issue right now. It's the OSAT houses backed up okay Those yep. packaging houses that are backed up yep. because they can't either there's a coke because a lot of them are in southeast asia there's a lot of shutdowns yep. a lot of covid um you know yep. a lot of things happening in those packaging houses it's like there is a whole the whole parking lot is full and they can't get in to get those things basically what's happening right yep. now to get that and, and they don't know when they can go up to opt optimal capacity and they want to expand capacity but they're also yep. to the point they can't get the machines or the people to expand the capacity because it's mostly machines yep. but there's also yep. people running the machines to run sure. it because the capacity, the big applied materials, LEM, all these guys who make the packaging, they can't get the components to build their machines either. So it's a chain. Yep. It's a constant chain. Yeah. I mean, you, you read about the like um, TSMIC and you know, like Infineon's expanding yeah. and you know, like every everybody that's doing wafer fab is expanding capacity somewhere. Those that don't do their own wafer fab are now considering doing their own wafer fab. Um, next thing you know, we're making ingots all over the place. Um, but, but that takes a couple of years. I mean, it takes a couple of years to build one of those facilities because the, 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 uh, there's rocket science and then there's making an IC. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, rocket scientists, but um, yeah. I think actually producing an IC ranks pretty close up there. It's an extremely, capital intensive and unbelievably complex manufacturing process. And that's why um, companies have gone fabulous because yeah, they, they don't want to- They don't want the capital, yeah. yeah. The, the capital investment to do that is tremendous. Um, and then when you find out that your, man, your, your contractor can't support you because they have to support somebody else, um, that becomes a little bit more attractive. Uh, <laughs> to have done, being able to done yourself. I think it's pulled Intel, it's helped, certainly helped Intel out that they were they were in the fire like a year and a half, two years ago. Um, but because they can actually produce their own chips, um, and now they're considering becoming a contractor um, to, to use that manufacturing capacity for somebody else. So, um, yeah, that that's going to be fairly dynamic. And again, when we, we talk, we talked a little bit before about the regionalization, um, and Southeast Asia is the the, the manufacturing that's is the the largest percentage of um, chips are being made here. Is that going to continue? Um, we're seeing a lot of other places now saying, right, we want to get into that um, chip manufacturing game. This uh, this pandemic has pushed us in a technology revolution. You know, for the next decade, uh, we are going to, the, the amount of components used in IoT, 5G, cryptography, whatever, um, automotive, oh, yeah. power, it's unreal. Everything communicates to each other. So, Yep. We are quintessential, like moving on a scale of, I think right now we're at three, about 500 billion a year using in components. They're saying by yep. by 2030, we'll double that easily, which yep. means we're just going up. But that means we need capacity. So everybody building capacity today is not going to fix the supply chain of today. It's going to fix the supply chain of the future. And yep. that, that's really what the companies are investing in, uh, especially Intel's and people do that because TSMC, yep. of course, all their eggs were in one basket. Of course, there's some political yep. issues now because they want to build now in Arizona. They're going to put a plant here. They want to build yep. because there's a lot of political between China and, and uh, Taiwan. They yep. want to make sure we don't have anything for the future that can happen between that. But again, you know, it's sorry to say, but all it comes back to is Wall Street and the public companies yep. pushing down the yep. prices and and margins. You know, they want to push down all the costs. If people don't realize yep. distribution is the lowest margin between yep. the manufacturer of the, the component and the manufacturer yep. of the gadget. They make all the yep. margin. Distribution makes sometimes single digit. If you look at Avnet or Arrow's bottom line or gross margin, yep. you'll be very surprised how much they yep. make. It's all top line revenue. But when it comes yep. to a point is they want all the services, DDU, design, stocking, hold inventory, liability, all these things. And then they want all, and they want the shirt off your back and they want, and this is what the manufacturers want, everything. And then yep. that's where the supply chain breaks because they don't want to hold enough inventory. So some of this has to change. There has to be some margin yep. given back to hold the liability of, as I say, a just-in-time 2.0 version, a more of a value yep. vendor managed inventory. All these processes are going to need to help support the future of component usage through the supply chain and the digitalization of communication because we're very traditional, old school, everything is very 
systems don't really yep. talk to each other that much. As you know, the top guys yep. yes, at one percent do, but the rest of the market they don't have these fan fancy systems that can do all the algorithms and prices and prices and, and do the the AI the AI implemented strategies that they have. And what's your thoughts on that for the next few years of manufacturing? The, I think the, the, the shift is going to um, probably go more towards the, I mean, we've been talking about the, like the, the contract manufacturers for the semiconductors. I think the shift is going to hit the EMS um, in that their supply chain systems um, are going to need to get much smarter. Um, that, I mean, we, the, we're you know, the things that are driving the shortage now, other than the pandemic, that didn't happen and you know, that wasn't existing in 2018. But okay. the the growth in you know, like electronic vehicles, the um, like the deployment of 5G, this is what caused the MLCC shortage in 2018. Two years later, everybody's scratching their heads, going, "Didn't we see this coming?" It's, going, it's the same drivers, um, <laughs> the exact same drivers that are hitting the the semiconductors that hit MLCCs in 2018. Um, so no, I don't think anybody learned from it. Um, the uh, EMS, I mean, you got, uh, they use their own internal part numbers or the OEM that they're producing for has an internal part number. So they don't use the component manufacturer's part number. So they're sitting there with a warehouse full of parts, but they don't even know that they have the one that they're looking for because they're looking for a different part number. Um, so I think the shift in the digitalization, the intelligence of these systems really has to hit with the EMS guys. Um, they need to be able to manage their own inventories and their demand uh, much better. They need to be doing, I mean, helping their customers understand forecasting. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the uh, ODMs really look to their, their production partners. That's part of what they should be asking them to do um, is you know, like, you need to provide us, you need to tell us where we have risk and be providing us guidance. You're the manufacturing expert. Um, it's kind of the same thing that we face. I mean, our job isn't to just test stuff. Our job is to help guide and, and provide some input to help people manage their, mitigate their risks. Um, so I think that shift is going to have to hit the, the electronic manufacturers. Um, and they don't run on particularly large margins either. Um, so well, that, you know, like after, and they're such large companies that you know, like, how do you implement a complete system, system change across 20 manufacturing facilities in, you know, in 15 different countries. Um, that's going to take a while to uh, even develop those systems and then deploy. Yeah, I agree. You know, that digital intelligence, as you brought up, is a big word and using a lot of people don't really understand what that means. But um, it's just data. It's using because we have compute and power and data is so important today. They say content is king. Data is king. You know, the biggest yep. data, the biggest data consumer always know is the Google. Google created this platform, all this data shared. But everybody needs, to, every company needs to have their own digital intelligence and data that tells the story, that calculate to make a better decision of process. Yep. That's one I, people don't know as I, I share is like, you know, that's why uh, Siemens, in my opinion, bought supply frame for their intelligence of the data that they use. And that's yep. a company that, hey, instead of us developing this ourselves, we have the capital. Let's just buy a company that has the data intelligence of all the procurement, yep. the procurement and data so we can acquire that. And as I said, that's just query data acquisition so they can create a, a, a yep. just business unit that can help feed their production and long-term yep. guidance of what they're doing for data intelligence. And but not a lot of companies have the money like Siemens to do some, yeah. something like that. So I I my prediction is the future, a lot more companies as compute gets cheaper, you know, the cloud is cheaper, compute power is getting cheaper. So the building algorithms yep. and devices and softwares is getting a little more easier to do to you know build all these bots and build the calculate data for companies yep. using complex CRM systems or supply chain management systems to to implement to their into their manufacturing process. So it yeah. it does, it does, it's gonna change a lot. I think there's a lot of because we been in this industry and i've been born in this industry i know this industry from uh, and it's amazing is the change as much as we're the foundation of all the gadgets in the world we supply the components we're still yep. way behind the leading software and edge computing it's amazing we need there's gonna be a lot of leaps and bounds in the next 10 years in, in the manufacturing yeah. supply chain i i think so i think that's you know, like they keep talking about the digital digitalization and 4.0 and that, that was that was the conversation before the pandemic hit and the shortage started um, so I don't think this is anything new, but I think it's certainly accelerating those efforts going, oh yeah, I remember we like, that was a kind of a marketing sort of thing or something that we're going to be working on. Hmm. Let's put a little bit more resources into accelerating that process a bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Um, I agree. 
Yeah, moving. I have a question I have for you before we wrap this up a little bit. It's like, how is everything? I mean, you've been in China now. I think what um, you haven't traveled. I know you've traveled to Hong Kong for about 18, 19 months. How is yep. the ground? How is everything in China? You know, I heard from my team what's going on, but how do you feel? What's going on between COVID, the lockdowns? Are everything's open, or what's your feeling right now? We are in. I live in Shenzhen, and in Shenzhen, we are very fortunate to be as safe as we have been. Um, I ex, uh, China did a very good job, I and mean, it, it, it didn't get great press, but it was certainly the right thing to do with the lockdowns that we encountered in you know, January up through February last year, and then sporadically as as some outbreaks hit. Um, it, it, like it's not fun, but it's certainly successful. And the way to beat this thing is by you have to suffocate it; otherwise, it's going to keep going everywhere. Um, Shenzhen, we've been very safe. I mean, we still follow our protocols for you know wearing masks and sanitizing our hands, but there's almost nobody here that has it. Xiamen, which is just east of uh, actually east north, uh, northeast of us, yeah. it's not far away in Fujian province. They're going through an outbreak now. Um, We've got a team in Zhengzhou, um, and they like they were going through the floods, and then they also had an outbreak of the D variant. Um, so there are pockets of it, but again, I think the efforts here to contain it once it's been outbreak, uh, when an outbreak hits, the containment practices here are very good, and it keeps the rest of the population safe. Um, we have heard that we can get to Hong Kong now, if as long as you've been vaccinated and you've been within one of the uh, like a, a risk-free or low risk area for a period of time like Shenzhen, we can get to Hong Kong without quarantine, uh, but we still need to quarantine coming back. Um, so it's like, oh, I got one foot across the bridge. I haven't seen my team there for you know, closing in on two years. And um, yeah, they've just been like, amazing how they've been able to, to do this. Um, uh, to, you know, they, they've, they've, they've gone through a hard time in terms of you know, like the volume that they were doing and, and the the, the risk there of infection was significantly higher than here. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, and these guys are packed onto the Metro. I mean, they're face to face with potential, um, potentially being risked with it. So I really need to get over and give those guys a hug and a pat on the back and, and spend yeah. some time with them. So um, that'll be fantastic when it happens, but um, we'll, again, we're not getting our expectations up. It's happened a few times that we thought we'd be able to travel and then we can't. So we try not to, to, you know, Get disappointed by that and just be excited when we're allowed to do it yeah, but how? overall i'd say things here are pretty they're quite safe um sure. it, generally things are good but we hear people in retail are really really struggling um that for, like, for multiple reasons but like the electronics industry is doing well those that have enough components to to manufacture but there's other areas of retail that are really struggling over the pandemic I mean, because there's not enough travel, tourism, things happening from other countries, um, which there was because yep. China was full. A lot of expats coming in and out. People go is a lot of travel and uh, trade, yeah, I know shows and, trade, and, uh, trade shows and hospitality. Yeah, hospitality yeah. and retail has been really hard hit. Um, right. And I think some of us, we just got used to doing more stuff at home um, <laughs> or not out and about. So we kind of kept with that pattern. It's like, yeah, man, actually, that worked out pretty well for us. So some of the things we used to do, even though we're, when we, we can do them again now, um, we're just we're out of the habit of doing it. We created new habits in that period of time. And it's been long enough that those habits have stuck. Um, so uh, things over here are generally safe. I think we're, everybody's just getting anxious to be able to travel. Yeah, overall, I mean, I know, talk about Fujian and Xiamen, you know, last week we had a, uh, one of our team members go to the plant in Xiamen and there was an outbreak. So he got back to Guangzhou, uh, the police were at his house and put him on quarantine yeah. immediately yeah. in two weeks. Yeah. Fortunately, we talked to him. He's, he's like, I'm in a great place. I have, you know, window, everything. I have internet. I can, they, they serve, I have food. Said, yeah. He's like, but that, that's the way they control it because I don't think the global economy can afford another outbreak in China. Nobody can afford because they can't afford China to be put down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that would be very much the case. Um, yeah. and I, I don't I don't know if China is controlling it to protect, you know, like to, to protect anybody but their own citizenship. Oh, um, it, it and, and that's entirely fair. That's that didn't yeah. sound right. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think that's the priority is to take care of the rest of the world. And it shouldn't be the priority is to take care of their own um, you know, everybody that's here. Um, and that is the way to do it. You, you come in here, you have to quarantine for three weeks. Um, and you know what happens? Not a whole lot. Like yeah. A couple of people are inconvenienced, but everybody else is fine. Um, and I, that's, I don't, I, I don't want to get political, but that sounds to me like the logical way to go about it. No, well, you know what? At the end of the it's day, it's inconvenient, but uh, you know, it's inconvenient for a few, but everybody else is better off. 
Yeah, but at least, you know, everything's happy. You guys traveling. How is you guys have any plans for you guys have time off for the holiday coming up in, in, in China? Um, we we're at the mid autumn festival here now. Um, so you know, our China facility, we still had guys out on Sunday, actually, um, probably working on your stuff. Um, actually, not probably definitely working on your stuff. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that was officially a holiday here, but we still had guys on trying to get a little bit ahead, take advantage of the break to get caught up a little bit. Um, but yeah, we've got the National Day holiday here um, or the Golden Week. So um, I think we're still going to end up having to have some people on. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody's been on very extended hours. And I think these these holidays become more important that people are really looking to need a chance to get spend some time with family and rest. Um, we'll have to see how things go in Fujian because um, when there's an outbreak, it gets very, very cautious. There is no travel into or out of Xiamen right now. Uh, I don't think we've got actually any team members that live there. Um, that's where their hometowns are, but I don't think, well, we'll have to see what happens, um, what kind of travel restrictions are in place, because if you got an outbreak that coinciding with the time of a major public holiday when most of the country wants to be on the road getting back to their hometowns, um, and that's when the biggest chance of large-scale um, infection is going to take place is when you've got everybody traveling and confined together. Um, so we'll have to see what happens next week because that's coming up in just about a week. So we'll see what happens. Um, hopefully everything will be safe and people are, um, are, are just logical about what they're doing. I mean, if you're going to travel through a high risk area, maybe you just want to stay where you are and call it in. Well, yeah, it's a little different here in the U.S., but we won't get into that. So, uh, uh, but anyways, well, I want to once again thank you, Mark, for coming on and really sharing your your uh, sharing about White Horse, the skill, the the capabilities, what you guys do of mitigating supply chain counterfeit subpar uh, components in the marketplace. Been a great partner, really giving us enlightenment to what's going on in the industry, how the component shortages work, how the testing protocols, how the X. I mean, we went over a lot of different topics, and I really I appreciate I around, your huh? knowledge. Yeah, I really appreciate. Well, really Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on, Robert. Really appreciate it. Good to see you again. I know the talk about travel restrictions. Spending time with um, with clients is something that we have always looked forward to and valued. And this is this is the best way we can do it right now. So I appreciate the time out of your schedule as well. No, anytime. Love to catch up when we get more information, what's happening, any new things happen to White Horse, and we'll go from there for very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, can't you wait bet. to talk to you again. Take care. All right. Talk to you soon.